So I'd like to introduce Emeritus Professor Bob Douglas, who is a public health um, expert epidemiologist who ran the National Centre for Epidemiology and Population Health at the Australian National University for quite a long time. Um, in fact, he set it up and um, he's going to facilitate the next session. So thank you very much for this, Bob, and over to you. Thanks very much, Peter. Everybody hear me? Yes. Um, well, now, I've been a member of the committee of the Canberra Alliance since its formation. And my main background, as uh, Peter says, is academic public health. But I'm particularly concerned about the way public policies are heading across a whole range of topics. Now, in this session, we'll be hearing from four people around the world who are looking at different elements of democracy and ways in which we can make it more responsive to the needs of communities. And we're going to begin with Ros, uh, Dr. Rosalind Fuller, uh, who is a political philosopher, a former university lecturer, and an expert on electoral systems, historical democracy, and digital democracy. And she now heads the Dublin-based Salonian Democracy Institute. She's the author of five books, and she frequently contributes to print, radio, and broadcast media on issues relating to democracy, as well as to international law and current affairs. Uh, she's run for office twice as an independent candidate in Ireland. Uh, Roz has already got a very impressive uh, video on the on the web, but maybe you'd like to talk briefly about mm. it, Roz. Okay, yeah, thanks very much for the introduction. I'm just going to share my screen because I talked a lot about why we did uh, the digital democracy report that we do every year, but I just like to briefly share kind of a little bit what it is actually. Um, I assume you can all see my screen now. Yes. which is kind of like a bunch of writing. Okay, I'll explain what it is. So we compared uh, last year 22 uh, pieces of software across 14 countries. Um, it's actually quite difficult to compare it because it all does a lot of different things, but we actually kind of have a low bar, um, a, a bar that people have to get over in order to be included in the report because it is quite extensive uh, what we do. So as you can see on the left, the example I'm going to use um, is a uh, Latvian based petition software, um, but there's a whole bunch of them in this, it's 78 pages long. So if you look on the left, we do a graph, um, a radar graph where we show what their functionality is. You can see that this one has three functionality areas, decision-making, ideation, and public consultation. And we rate them using about 31 criteria against how well they fulfill these functions. Other functions, for example, would be like task automation and participatory budgeting or deliberation. But this particular tool doesn't do that. It's a petition tool that only does these three things. Um, but as you can see, it scored really well in ideation. Um, we also score them against security, which is very important, obviously, for digital tools. Um, depends what you're doing. Some things don't really need that much security. We tend to be quite aggressive on security and try to be pretty tough on that point. And we also do ability to execute because we think that's very, very important for people who are considering using these tools to know what kind of a track record do they have? How well have they delivered in the past? Because especially for public officials, mm. um, that's something that's very, very important. And then we have a little spot here on the right that says, you know, who should maybe use the software so people can get a good overview of that. We have a brief explanation on all of them of what it actually does. So we tried to be both as brief and as detailed as we can. This one is a petition software. It has some features on it. We kind of explain those features, who can vote, how they can vote, how it plugs into the political system in Latvia, um, what the mission is. So what is this thing trying to do? Varied, some of them, as I said, maybe focus more on public consultation. Some maybe focus more on voting. So just doing like election voting online, we have some that just do that. Um, some of them are more broad, so we kind of capture that in there so people can get a quick overview of that. Um, we judge their ability to execute um, based on several things, based on their active customers, because we think that's a pretty good, you know, kind of track record of how well they're actually going to deliver a project. 
um, because that can vary quite widely in this field. So there's, there's some things that are kind of really established and then you get some kind of fly by night things as well. Um, we also do case studies. So we look at case studies pretty thoroughly and talk to references how exactly things have worked. You know, has it actually delivered power to people, right? Has it actually made a difference? You know, do you have something that can prove that this is actually creating change in the real world rather than just being kind of a feel good experience for the people involved? Um, and we look at things like their experience, their workforce um, and unique selling points. When it comes to security, we look at encryption, user data, um, which is quite important here in Europe and storage. Those are things that we have quite strict laws around here. Um, so often we see like European ones doing a better job than American ones on that point. Um, and also if they use blockchain, for example. So those are all things that kind of play into how secure this is because of course it could be quite a disaster for again, a public body to have like a security breach, you know, again, depending on what it is. Um, we had a security expert do a kind of internal security analysis of them. We'd like to also do penetration testing in the future, but obviously that has some legal problems uh, with it, just in case our hackers get a bit out of control. Uh, but that's something we're definitely looking at doing in the future. For now, we do kind of an internal assessment, how well they're handling like passwords, cryptography, their information security po uh, policies around that. Um, and we had a volunteer uh, who did all that for us, who's a security uh, information security expert. Um, we do access We look at their accessibility. Again, a quite important point, especially for public bodies. Um, does this tool provide, is it something that deaf or blind people can use easily? This one we didn't have, it is either scored not implemented or no information available. Some of them score that they have done things. And then the highest score you can get is if you have an official certification that um, you are indeed fully accessible software. Um, and quite a few of them have that actually. So this one, we also kind of give a few standout features so people can say, okay, what does this thing have that others, others don't have? What's special about this? Um, in this situation, we said, what's special about this one? It focuses on the feasibility of policy proposals. So if you were to say, I want to put in a petition in Latvia that everyone should get a free unicorn, they won't let that go. So there is some kind of level of control with this, like a small, a very small bit of control, but still some kind of feasibility control, which is always an issue because you want to have a process that's very, very open. At the same time, sometimes things can become kind of like internet pranks and kind of sort of destroy themselves. So this is also kind of an important uh, factor here. Also this one, which was very impressive about this piece of software is that it was integrated with online banking software that allowed for authentication and micro donations. So it has actually an instrument to keep financing itself which is also very important, like who pays the piper calls the tune. So this uh, particular organization had a way of financing itself and remaining independent, which was quite important. Um, and then finally, we did a kind of assessment of client feedback. So we talked to a lot of people who'd use these um, tools. Some of them were public officials, some of them were average people, like these people were all over the place. It was actually really interesting uh, to talk to them and get their feedback and their experience of using it, what they said the pros and cons were. Um, we rated that on like how well did they set expectations. You know, a big problem in this industry would be that people kind of promise the sun, moon, and the stars and don't deliver. So like are you actually delivering the product and the experience you said you were going to deliver? Um, did they help people get through it? Um, did they, you know, provide like support, you know, if something goes wrong? Um, did they provide a feedback loop? People know where they're at in the process. They know what happened with what happened, you know, what happened with my proposal? Did it ever get voted on? That kind of thing. Um, and whether or not they'd recommend it. So we also gave them points kind of based on that. So as I said, we did a whole lot of software. A lot of them were different. This was just one of them. Um, and we're probably going to do about 10 more at least uh, next year. We do have two Australian ones that we have done in small snippets because they're kind of starting. And I know that Thor has his as well. So um, we hope to see a lot more from Australia as well in the future. Thanks very much, Roz. Uh, that's very comprehensive and uh, very impressive. Uh, I think we'll, we'll move straight on to uh, Thor. Uh, Thor Prohaska. He stood for the Queensland federal seat of Dixon in 2015 and 2019, and he has been a federal or state candidate six times since 2013. He'll be standing again in Dixon in 20, 2022. And he's going to tell us about the Dixon Reps way that brings together the best 
of the direct and representative democracy models to address the shortcomings of both and to build a broad and deep community voter network to inform their federal member of the electorate's will. So it's really keeping in touch with the electorate. Over to you, Thor. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I'd like to start by quoting Henry Thoreau, sorry, David Thoreau. Um, if you know this gentleman, he was a political philosopher and author. He wrote Walden back, um, sorry, to adjust my camera, um, over a century ago. And <clears throat> he said, there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. He said this when he was speaking to philanthropists. And he then went on to say, and it may be that he who bestows the largest amount of time and money on the needy is doing the most by his mode of life to produce that misery which he strives in vain to relieve. So this sort of like um, elucidates the idea that there can be a root cause of something and then all these symptoms actually flow to that root unless we address that root then we're going to continue to have these problems, no matter how much money we throw at it. <coughs> Pardon me. It is my contention that the root of evil in the case of democracy is that the constitution and legislation that supports our parliamentary system is completely silent on the relationship between the voters and their member who is voting on their behalf on bills and legislation. This appears to be due to the historical Westminster system's doctrine of parliamentary supremacy that in essence says that the members of parliament were of superior moral and intellectual capacity and that they did not need to be constrained with things like the separation of powers um, that exist between the parliament, the executive and the enforcement arms of government to prevent the formation of dictatorships. And I'd also say that it's because um, at every turn, the ruling powers over the centuries have sought to block and diminish the formation of properly functioning democracies. So they let them sort of get a little bit of democratic gain and they pull it back. And so in effect, the, um, the as became absolutely and fundamentally clear when I read Rosalind's book, Beasts and Gods, um, which I, um, I actually um, heard about Rosalind when she was being interviewed by, of all people, Amanda Vanstone on Counterpoint. And um, the, one of the key messages is that in effect that there are no actual democracies on the planet and that all so-called democracies are really elected oligarchies. Now, one of the examples I like to give is, um, um, well, before I say that, I believe that Australia has everything it needs pretty much to be a functioning democracy. But we can see the symptoms, the outcome of it is that it is acting as an elected oligarchy. You know, the political parties have a small group of people that control policies. Um, there are more paid up members of the Collingwood Football Club, bless their hearts, than there are financial members of all the political parties in Australia. So why don't we actually have democracy? Well, I'd say it is because of the simple fact that, um, that there is this one piece missing, which is the root. Now, the example of a car, um, if you take the fuse out of the ignition circuit of a car, um, you'll no longer be able to drive it but you will be able to use it to say, sleep in, um, get a few mates around and load the car up with stuff and push it places. So it does have function, but if you put that fuse back in it, the function that it has is greatly enhanced. You can do things with it that just was not possible before. So I say that if we put the fuse being that we must make it law, that when push comes to shove, that the elected representatives have to vote as directed by the voters. Like without that element, no system of government is actually a democracy. 
And the fact is that even if a large number of people wanted to make this law by changing the constitution or even the legislation that underpins parliament, then it would take a lot of effort and a long time. So up here in Dixon, to address that problem, um, what we've done is that we've said, I've already signed this, uh, but any candidate, and we're looking potentially to have you know, 10, 20, 40, as many independent candidates as possible in this electorate, signing this Commonwealth statutory declaration, legally pledging to represent the majority of voters or potentially go to jail for four years. So once a candidate actually signs that, um, if and when they're elected, then that binds them to have to actually do that. Now, I say that if we do that, sort of like iron filings, when you've got a magnet underneath a field of iron filings, when you move that, everything else, all those filings reorient and reorientate around it. So I think if you made it law that elected representatives must do what their uh, constituency wants, then all these other things, like we wouldn't need an ICAC because it wouldn't matter how much money corporations gave to um, the candidates or the people involved in representing, they'd still be doing what the majority want. Um, so the, um, the, um, um, the, all the symptoms that we're talking about, I believe could be addressed by making that one simple change. Now, direct democracy, uh, I've spoken with a lot of people over the years who are great fans of, of direct democracy. And they're, you know, like to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. To a person who believes in direct democracy, um, the solution always is usually online democracy. Everyone's going to join up and life's going to be good. Um, but the actual fact is, I've yet to see that happen. Um, and the current representative democracy that we have, um, which is in effect an elected oligarchy, uh, I mean, Rosalind's work really shed some great light on um, the Greeks, the Romans, how the Romans took the Republican model and kept elections, whereas the Greeks realized that elections caused oligarchies and they actually got rid of elections. And that's why the Greek democracy flourished. But the Republican model used by the Romans actually ended up um, in a dictatorship or an empire. Um, and it was very interesting in her work to see that what was happening on the streets of Rome prior to them becoming the empire was almost a carbon copy of what we see today um, in our system of representative democracy. Uh, so by putting together direct and representative democracy into the one, uh, one model, um, it also recognizes that the vast majority of people do not have time to be involved. That's one of the flaws I'm being wound up, sorry. So one of the flaws of uh, direct democracy is that people don't have time. What we're in essence doing is saying, okay, we wanna build a network where we're going to collect the proxies using community representatives, funnel it all up to the top in the form of a consensus where we in the community work on specific bills that are leading up to legislation that's going to be passed. And um, I believe, and I probably need to go into this a little bit more detail, but now it's not the time, that this model um, actually um, addresses, takes the best of both systems, puts it into one that it is effective and it will actually engage the people on the ground. Thanks very much, Thor. Uh, I should add that people who've only just joined us or who uh, have not seen any of the earlier materials should be able to, should refer to the uh, very extensive material that uh, our two, the first two speakers have already uh, put onto the web and of course you'll be able to get exactly what we say in this discussion and hopefully we'll have some time at the end of this session to discuss the various ways in which these these tools can be used. So our third speaker is Evan Predovic and he's going to talk to us using information that he believes can hold our uh, politicians to account. Evan was a professional publisher a North Sydney councillor and is the founder of an organisation called Political Gadgets, which is a website focused on presenting information about our politicians. 
and he, he's uh, already put uh, some material on the web and he's going to tell us very briefly about the very broad range of ways we can think about how our representatives behave, vote, use our money and make decisions on our behalf. Over to you, Evan. Thanks, Bob. Um, I guess I've got three key points. The first is that citizen access to information is crucial for any type of functioning democracy. In these days with Facebook, with our politicians prepared to tell bareface lies, to stonewall reporters, media aggregating into the hands of a very small number of people who don't see it as a means of actually giving the public information anymore or asking difficult questions, people have got to have access to information. They're willing to make, if they're going to make informed decisions. So the good news in Australia is that there's a lot of data available from our government on everything from how our politicians vote to where grant money goes, to who's making donations, to how the politicians are spending money. There's a lot of data available. The harder part is making that data into information that people find engaging and useful. And that's what Political Gadgets is aiming to achieve. It's taking the information that's there and trying to put it into a format that people will engage with. Now, in an ideal world, you know, people are willing to drill into databases. They're willing to um, read long documents. It's just not going to happen. But you know, we all know that the number of people who are interested in what's happening on MasterChef vastly exceeds the number of people engaging in political in the political discourse in Australia. So what we're trying to do is make that information accessible and interesting. I guess a simple example of that, which is my current favorite, is um, something that came out of the electorate in which I live, which is North Sydney. Now we have a liberal, it's a safe liberal seat, has been for a long time. We have a moderate liberal member of parliament in Trent Zimmerman, who is overtly, in terms of what he says, pro doing something about climate change. But Trent votes in complete lockstep with the rest of the party. So he votes exactly the same way that Peter Dutton does, who, for your purposes, Rosalind, would be the far right of the party. And so what we did, we've, we've been saying this for ages. We've been saying that, because and the, the, the numbers show this exactly. It's easy to say. It's easy to line up. But getting that message across is harder. So what we created was the votes like dutton o -meter. So that shows not just Trent, but each of our members of parliament, how closely they align to Peter Dutton's voting. Trent is 92.1% Dutton. On the other hand, Anthony Albanese is from memory, something like 17.1% Dutton. Now that little meter that sits with a picture of Peter Dutton's head in the middle of it, flashing around on the screen, is something which does engage people, and we know that. It's something which gets the message through to them more effectively. So that's what we're trying to do. But it does bring me to my third point. It's an important point. Um, our government does make a lot of data available, but it's got absolutely no incentive to make that data either effective or useful. The donations data they publish as a sign of much virtue is a complete and utter mess. The data on who gives donations doesn't match up with the data on who receives donations. Deloitte's, as an example, it's the example I always give, is in the database in 17 different ways. They're Deloitte's, they're Deloitte. They're Deloitte with two T's and Deloitte with one T. It goes on and on. It is an utter mess. Declarations of interest are done on paper, handwritten on paper, and then, then published as PDFs. And if there's anyone who tries to do anything with government data, PDFs are an absolute nightmare. Expenses data is published months after the money is spent and so on. And I believe it's crucial for whatever sort of democracy we have that we pressure our government to make information available more effectively because without that information being available, there's no way that our citizens can make informed decisions. 
So those are my three messages. Um, Thanks. And I'm just reading the um, next question, whether we're working with the data portals. Look, yes. And, and one of the, the fundamental things that, uh, and Bob was very nicely describing political gadgets as an organization. It's not. It is me. It's a website and a small network of people who know more than I do about particular things that come together and to produce political gadgets. Um, so one of our core things is trying to take information, making it current by using APIs, which means we're doing it programmatically. Um, we don't want to have to touch the information and do it with, um, and actually put a lot of effort in. So, we're, so getting hold of the data from the raw information coming from the governments, absolutely. And that's the sad thing though, the information is coming, but it's coming in formats that take a lot of skill and a lot of effort to actually turn into something useful. Um, and I have to say that, um, in contrast, one of the other things we do use, we use um, they vote for you and Open Australia's data a lot um, because they do have the resources to put people's hands on things and use people's brains to interpret stuff. Um, and then we take that and try and actually present it in what I like to think is um, a slightly more engaging fashion. Hiding data in plain sight is exactly um, a phrase that we use an awful lot. Um, and if you'll excuse my language, political data fuckery is the other phrase we use a lot when talking about PDFs because it is a, we find the government makes this stuff available, talks about how wonderful they are making it available and then makes it as hard as possible to get out. Now, a cynical person would say that's a conspiracy. Others might say it's just inefficiency. The job is given to somebody who is you know, way down the chain. I actually think it's just because the people doing the job often don't ever use the data. Someone's tasked with making the data available, but they never try and do anything with it. There's also a lack of incentive to change. It would be very easy, for example, with donations to make the donations data all add up if everybody simply had to use their ABN or tax file number in making a donation. That would be a trivial change to make instead of which somebody gets to type into a piece of paper, write in a piece of paper or type into a database whatever name they want, which is inherently inefficient. And they know perfectly well, doesn't work properly, but zero incentive obviously to make that better. Thanks very much, Evan. Uh, now, our final uh, contributor is Marcus Crowley. Now, Marcus is head of product at, a, uh, at uh, an organization called PlayScore, where he has produced the livability platform, a tool for local government to better inform their strategic plans uh, based on community input. He was also responsible for analysing the data from the recent livability uh, census, which helps us to understand what Australians care about and how we uh, think about the places we live in. In 2019, Marcus created Beat Josh. I love it. A website for sharing and commenting on budgets in a simple and consistent matter, manner. His latest project is Active Democracy Australia, an online toolkit for electorate action in conjunction with the Canberra Alliance and with Rob Salter, who I think is on the, on the call. Uh, over to you, uh, please, uh, uh, Marcus. Thanks, Bob. As we've only got a few minutes, and I'm very interested to get into the Q&A, uh, as you can tell from the introduction, I wear a few hats, and they're completely different, and I don't want to confuse you. Um, I think uh, I agree with everything that's been said so far, and I would encourage you in particular to explore the things that Evan is doing, um, because he, I think he's barking up the right tree. Um, so rather than uh, um, talk about things that perhaps others have touched on. I thought it would be good for me to talk a bit about what I do at PlayScore. Thankfully, I am in a role where I actually get paid to do something that is uh, oriented to the protection and the preservation of uh, democracy in a small way. And I'd like to just share that with you um, because I think it might be insightful. And for those of you that live in Australia, at least, it will give you some sense that, ah, there is something that we can do right now um, already. And so I'm going to share my screen and just talk you through a couple of slides, which uh, might prompt some questions. So I will share this. Here we go. Can you see my slide? It's green. 
Yes. Very good. Okay. So this is the presentation that's available on the DemFest website. Uh, I didn't record a video, so let me just uh, take you through some of the key points. So the company I work for, PlayScore, is a, I suppose you could call it a startup. Uh, I've been there for a few years. We're a small company based in Sydney, but we operate around the country. And we were uh, fortunate to win a grant from the federal government last year or two years ago, last year, um, to conduct a nationwide survey on livable on the topic of livability. So the sort of democracy that I'm going to be talking about here is at a local level. In Australia, we have three levels of government for those of you that are overseas. Um, so we have the federal level, which is national. We have the state level, and we have local government that particularly uh, looks after. Uh, livability, councils, uh, you know, rubbish collection, um, and small-scale uh, improvements to well-being. So uh, thanks to the grant from the government, we were able to run a nationwide survey, and we collected um, responses from people not only online but also face-to-face. -face. And so we, we had a large online survey that was available for three or four months and uh, for places where we had gaps right so there were certain demographics or certain geographies that we needed to capture we went and we sent people on the street uh, at, to be honest at great expense uh, to go and fill in the gaps and get some opinions from people who were uh, not perhaps online or at least they weren't particularly interested in filling in the survey online. Anyway, as a result of all this, we got 30,000 responses, which we're very happy with. Uh, and the questions that we asked uh, were local level questions. Um, and the questions are on the screen there. What would you value in your ideal neighborhood? And then how do you rate your current neighborhood? And what big or small ideas do you have? And in answering the questions, we provided people with the opportunity to choose between what 50 so-called livability attributes. Um, and as a result of the survey, you can see that uh, the top three livability attributes that most Australians valued are on the left-hand side. And when we say most valued, that means what do you think is important to you in your ideal neighborhood? And so these are the three that Australians chose. On the right-hand side, we have a different three, uh, three different attributes from the same set of 50. And the question here was, tell us what you think is being done well, right? So how, how well do you think these things are being done in your area? And so it's interesting that the, three li the, the two lists are different. What people think is important to them and how they think uh, and what attributes they think are doing well are, are actually quite different. And I think this is an interesting uh, split to make. And I think Thor, on one of your slides, you had something similar where you, it was urgency versus importance. What um, quite often people will raise their voices and complain about things, uh, but if presented with a list of, okay, well, tell us what's most important to you, uh, they often choose something else rather than the thing that they're complaining about. And so what this allows us to do is to draw maps, and this is just one of many that we've done, um, but this is from two months ago, I think. And uh, this actually shows us uh, across the country with those 30,000 responses, what people are saying about livability. And this is the, this is the right hand side. This is how do you rate your neighborhood? Um, and it was interesting to me, I've lived in Melbourne, I've lived in um, Sydney now for most of my most of my adult life. Um, it was interesting to see the variation across the country. And although these numbers, the range in between these numbers is actually quite small. Once you dig into certain neighborhoods or certain uh, council areas, local government areas, as we call them in Australia, you can actually see quite a lot of variety. You see also a lot of variety across age groups and across uh, genders, not so much. Men and women in Australia generally feel the same about everything. Um, there's very, very small variations, but across age groups, it's very, very different. Uh, and I know you've probably all heard about that at the national level when it comes to the big issues like climate change and so on. Um, and so this data, we analyzed it in many different ways. There is a free report available to you online, um, mostly probably of interest to those of you that live in Australia called the State of Place Report. You can go to placescore.org and download that if you like. And there's a link at the end of this, um, which will tell you more if you're interested in this. Um, and we've also built a platform. And so the way we make money, and as I said, I'm fortunate to be employed in a situation that 
enables me to do something to help uh, democracy, even though it is at a local level, um, is we sell access to the platform, which allows that data to be analyzed and drilled down into uh, and local local councils predominantly by uh, access to that platform. And so he, here is a little snapshot from one of the pages. Uh, and this allows us to, well, this allows the council to say, okay, well, what's important to my community? What is working well? Uh, so in this diagram, the, 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 the green dots represent what's working well, the red dots represent what's not working well, uh, and the yellow dots represent, well, if you had more time and money and, and resources, then you could also focus on these issues. As you can see, many of the 50 attributes lay in this lie in this gray zone, which means, fine, you can look at them, you can find the data, but uh, it's not what people are expecting you to do. Apart from the quantitative data, we also capture, um, if you remember from my first slide, we also capture ideas. Um, and so we ask people, if you had 25 words, or you do have 25 words, given 25 words, what would be your idea for improvement of your local area? And so we have tens of thousands of these now. Um, little little sentences. A lot of people try and cram, cram many ideas into 25 words, uh, which proves it to be a challenge when we analyze the data. Um, but what it allows us to do is to provide councils with a, with a snapshot of this is what your community wants. Uh, we try and balance it by age. We try and, try and balance it by gender and uh, um, also uh, country of birth and things like that so that it matches the population uh, as told, you know, the, the splits in the census. And it allows us to provide councils with, as I said, that plan. And the reason that's important and the reason that works for us in Australia is there is legislation in place uh, or regulations in place that uh, require local government to consult with the community. I think the last time I looked at it, uh, the Victorian legislation said, you must consult with the community. It wasn't particularly detailed. Um, so exactly how that is done uh, varies across the country. Uh, but our platform and our surveying and our data analysis uh, provides one way for them to tick that box and to say, we have consulted with the community. Uh, now what's come out in the last week or two, I think, is a, uh, at least in New South Wales, there is a requirement for um, local government to actually report on what they're doing and report on how they're consulting with the community. So the, the screw is tightening and the requirement for governments to do the right thing by their communities is actually pretty good at the moment. And Bob's winding me up. So um, if you did want to know more, uh, there's some links there and happy to have some questions as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, you didn't say anything about beat Josh in that uh, brief uh, period, but it seemed to me that was also a, a very important opening for people to better understand where their money is going. Yes. Um, okay, uh, Gil, so have we got any uh, pressing questions? Gillis? Gil. You mean Gil? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> also, I didn't, I didn't introduce myself. I'm also a member of CAPAD. Um, well, there was a comment from Nick who says that uh, he's finds what you've said in a very interesting, Marcus, uh, as have most of us, I'm sure, that it reminds him of somewhat of a process in Toronto called Kids Score, run by an organization called Maximum City. Do you wish to ask a bit more about that, Nick? No, not really. It just um, there's a, 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 a similarity there in terms of, I mean, this, this process is specifically on, on thinking about place in terms of from the lens of, a, of, of children and so rating place based on on and engaging kids specifically on how they view their surroundings so it's a it's maybe an iteration of that process but fo fo focus specifically on children uh, it's interesting nick thanks for bringing that up i'll check them out uh, also nick uh, you asked uh, if gadgets works with open raw in parentheses data portals that are increasingly being populated by governments. Yeah, I was just, it, I, I'm just curious about there's, you know, there's a push towards open data, right? We have Australia, Canada, a lot of other organizations pushing for that, you know, some, some countries populating more than others raw data, you know, and I guess one of the challenges is can community organizations specifically mobilize raw data and through the open data portals 
and some places you're able to see that and I think you know there's been some work on places like Chicago that can mobilize their open data others it's really obtuse and difficult some it's not even populated and like you said so I'm just interested in in the work that you're doing Evan. so I'll have to look into that okay uh, I'm, there is a, a wealth of potential material to strengthen democracy in the in the four presentations we've heard uh, not much of it, I suspect, is actually going into changing the way we think about democracy in Australia. Um, would, would, can I invite uh, each of the speakers to, to comment on how, how much they believe this is currently in, in, uh, in action, apart from in their own little backyard? And, and maybe I can uh, uh, begin with, uh, with Evan and... Uh, um, uh, and um, uh, Thor, on, on the extent to which you think that the ideas you've put forward are actually implement, being implemented or implementable. Maybe start oh. with Thor. Uh, well, I believe the, uh, I've spent years fine tuning this model that we're looking to use and um, the brutal fact is that unless you raise an army of people, um, th this was kind of highlighted in the big deal. They basically said, you either need a lot of money or a lot of people. We don't have a lot of money. So the aim is to get a lot of people. Now to do that, you have to go out and do community engagement and talk to people. Now there's this general feeling that Australians are apathetic. They're not interested in this stuff. They'd rather watch MasterChef and to a certain extent, that's true because Australians aren't stupid and they can see that this system is not functioning correctly, but they don't know what to do about it. I mean, it's a really thorny problem. You really got to dig down and find out what the fundamentals are. And the current power structure doesn't want you to do that. They don't want you to focus on, for example, the fact that everything ha that happens before a vote in parliament is kind of peripheral and everything that happens after is peripheral to the actual reality of that vote being cast on that bill on the floor of parliament. Now, if we focus on that, then that raises a question um, and the, uh, the stuff that Evan's doing, you'd be able to see this stuff more clearly um, as to what the, uh, how your parliamentarian is voting. Is, are they voting as you want? Well, I mean, we've got another fundamental problem and this goes back to the engagement of people. How do we know what the people in the electorate want? I mean, it's really challenging to do. I mean, I don't know if any of you know about a small document written by a gentleman called Arthur Tresby, Your Will Be Done. Um, he was a member for Griffith from in the 50s and 60s. And he basically was a constitutional analyst. He looked at the constitution and said, fundamentally, political parties' role is to select a candidate, put them up, and once they're elected, to step back. A little bit like what the uh, Voices model does. Um, but he then went on to say that it's every voter's responsibility and duty to actually inform the elected member of their will. Now, he has this model of using will letters, and this was about 10 years ago. There was a lot of activity on social media about this, but it died off. But the, uh, the, the challenge is, is how do you get, and this goes to the engagement, how do you get all those people in the electorate to lock, write those will letters? Well, 90, 95, 98% of people don't have the time to do this. So that particular part of the problem, um, I believe we've fixed that by using proxy votes. So we have community representatives. You know, there are people who like doing this representation, like talking to people, like going and doing community engagement. Now, if we can identify those people and they can collect the proxies, like, for example, my wife hates me talking about politics, my next door neighbour, he doesn't want to be involved, but they've given me their proxy. So I can look at a bill and I can go, well, yes, this is what I think on that bill. Now, um, the other fact is that if you look at all the bills, like there's over 100 before Parliament at the moment, maybe closer to 200, some going back to 2015 that have been put up at private members' bills don't even reach the floor of parliament they're very complicated and to know what how you want to vote on that is even more challenging because of that level of complication so our um our method to address that is finding the people 
who are really interested in that particular bill area and developing these groups of expertise in the electorate. We've got over 100,000 people, and I believe if we can harness all of those people who care, and they use the proxy votes, um, then we can actually develop a consensus on a bill in effectively real time, and we can then communicate it to the elected member. In our situation, Thank you. yep. Can, uh, now, Evan, do you want to say anything about that? Um, I guess I, I have um, a less ambitious goal. I'm, I'm trying to do two things. One is I'm a great believer in getting independence into Parliament. And much as I would like to change the whole system, I think working, I guess I'm a cynical enough to go, I need to work within the system to make a change that is going to be effective. And so my first move is trying to get independence into Parliament and trying to make sure that they're held to account, as well as everybody else. But it's much harder to hold the parties to account than it is to go, OK, so how is our independent voting? And are they broadly, at least, reflecting the will that put them there? Now, the, the difficulty I see with what Thor is putting forward is just, and, I, and I'm not criticizing in any way, but it is that, that process of how do you get a functioning level of engagement that is not, it is not in ending up in exactly the same place that we already are. Now, if I was to, if we had my local member who I sat on council with for five years and know fairly well as a consequence, if we had my local member here, I'm sure he'd say that's exactly what he does. He refers back to his electorate and he is the proxy for the electorate. Now, my own political hero is Ted Mack and Ted Mack would argue that's not the case. You were never elected to be the proxy for the electorate. You were supposed to reflect the electorate, not, not put your own brain on top of that and make your own decisions. But that, that is the, the crux of the problem as I see it. And I think the way to deal with that as far from my point of view, is about information. It is about an informed electorate so that those who want to get involved actually understand what their representative is doing, that the representative has a good pathways, and this is what Marcus is doing, comes into play to understand what the electorate's actually saying. And that that loop of the electorate's will is being given some clarity, and then they can see whether their representative is actually giving effect to that to me improves the system. Now, that's not revolutionary. It just doesn't change the whole system. It doesn't get past the reality. And I fully buy into this reality that we are, we have an oligarchy in place, that the party system is awful. But I think that's where I'm at is that trying to, is trying to get something within the system to make it better and improve what we've already got. Thank you, Evan. Uh, Rob has a question for Rosalind. Right, um, excuse me. Um, Yes, Rosalind. Um, I was very interested in your presentation. Um, it seems to me that in, in these kind of measures towards uh, sort of direct democracy by digital means, just like any direct democracy, there are two sort of um, forms. There are ones that tend to occur in America where you get a, just a question put. It's often a very controversial question that's been uh come come about in the in the context of populism it might be you know putting a cap on taxes or um whatever and that often i think tends to produce bad outcomes and then there are more deliberative means of um of dealing with this by requiring people who want to participate to um go through a process of discussion and receiving information um, and I'm wondering whether you think that uh, whether there are models that are more towards that second alternative that really engage people in deliberation informed deliberation before they have to vote and and the, the second part of it is how we can get more information about what are the best systems that you know about yeah okay just to add a few things to the to the previous question though as well um, the, the things that we're doing and the digital democracy things that we're doing are by no means small scale. I mean, some of these things are enormous. So Rousseau, for example, which won our impact award, I think quite justifiably, 
um, was being used by the government of Italy for years and years and years. I mean, those people rocked Italy. They are the government of the eighth largest economy in the world and have been for years. Um, Polis, which is used in Russia, has been used in, just was used in the federal elections in Russia during um, the pandemic, you know, and it was used by the Supreme Court to communicate with each other between it as well. Um, the things I was talking about in Latvia have changed a lot of laws. So like there's people living in Latvia today living under different laws because of that software. And there's a lot more examples like this. So we're talking really quite major impact on people's lives and sometimes in a huge way, actually. Um, so that's just the first thing I wanted to say based on the previous question about it being in small scale. This stuff, some of it is, but some of it really, really, really isn't. Um, to be, to get to your question, um, we did look at deliberation as part of our part of our criteria as well. Um, some places do it, some places don't. Um, when you talk about like making the best decisions though, like for me, I think like that's kind of a thing that has to be democratically determined. I mean, we have referendums here as well, all of the time in Ireland. I voted in tons of referendums since I've become an Irish citizen. Um, there have been at least, I don't know, like sometimes we have a couple of referendums every year. Um, in Switzerland, close by, they usually have now about 12 or more referendums a year as well. Um, I don't think those things are going badly. Um, I don't think in the US things are necessarily um, going badly. The US is probably the most oligarchic country in the world. People try to use referendums as a way to control a government that's very, very far outside of their control otherwise and has very little to do with people, especially um, in less populated states. So I would disagree that there is a kind of best decision that we're trying to herd people towards. Um, much as I think things like what Evan is doing on information is very useful, it's very useful to me because I have spent days and days and days and days and days also calculating information like that when I'm writing articles, like also going through all of those Deloitte spelled five different ways kinds of things to try to get my numbers right. So I can see how it's very, very useful. Um, I don't think, however, in some ways, I don't think that there's a lack of information in the sense that people are missing the top line information. People are well aware of the fact that that corporations lobby politicians. It's not like it's not like I'm I also feel myself, why am I even doing this research? Who am I proving this to? It's another little brick in the wall, but is it the real difference maker? I don't really think so. So I'm kind of I'm kind of a little bit wary about the we need to provide people with specific information. I mean, yeah, sure, information is important, but I don't I don't really see people as being that un as uninformed and as hopeless myself. Okay. Thor asks uh, another question. I, guess I can just say something quickly, sorry. I mean, it's great for people to talk to each other, you know? I think it's great because it avoids, it avoids kind of the media narrative to some extent. Like you get this kind of narrative put on from the top saying these are the issues uh, and these are the possible solutions. We're losing you. Uh, there you go. There's our technical difficulty. So I think it is very good that people talk to each other horizontally, you know, but um, I don't think it's a matter of like kind of like my information is the best or this is the best decision you have to be doing. So Thor has asked uh, also what happens if the elected rep doesn't do what the voter wants, which uh, as we know is uh, much of the time. Any ideas on that? What's the best way that you, you feel that this can be done, having a bit of a... Well, if I can just simply say what the general answer to that is, well, you can vote them out at the next election. Well, that's, a, the, that's what all the elected members I talk to about say that. So that's the you know, standard response. Can, can I ask Marcus, do you have any sort of reflective comment on, on the breadth of this discussion? Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, very interesting voices uh, and what I said at the beginning about collaborating, uh, the brain, one's brain is not big enough to adequately deal with all the issues. I think there is a complexity issue with our democracy and our legal system. Um, we have, re I've, I, I did a law degree, I did a computer science degree. Um, and we've reached a point where the world is just too complicated, whether it be Barack Obama or whoever they send off to go and negotiate the Palestinian peace process. It doesn't matter how much money and how much time and, and how many clever people we throw at things. Uh, the world has just become so complicated. It, it reminds me, uh, and Evan can maybe sympathize with this, it reminds me of a piece of software that has been developed 
over generations and generations and generations with different programmers and developers adding to it and adding to it and adding to it and adding to it. Um, and the legal system is exactly the same thing. You have lawyers that come and they add a bill and then the bills get longer and longer and longer and longer and more and more complicated and more and more turgid and more and more loopholes or in the software sense bugs come into it. And it doesn't matter who we elect. Uh, there will always be a, a, a few problems there that can bring that person down or cause them to fail. You know, look at, look at the, um, what is it, the, what do they call them, the midterm elections in the US, for example. You might vote, say, okay, there's a big hoo-ha about voting for the right president. Uh, but if you don't then have Congress on your side, then nothing can get done. And so I think there is a, for me, uh, and I didn't talk about B. Joshua earlier, um, we can talk about that some other time, but for me, I think the interesting area is between government, um, media, education, and the community. I think in Australia, we have the benefit of being one of the few nations in the world where we do have mandatory voting. You would therefore expect that we would be doing democracy better than anywhere else. Um, if we don't prepare the kids to know how to vote, and my son's just finishing high school this year, um, and I know that he hasn't been through the training that's required to actually go and vote responsibly. Yes, you can queue up for a sausage every four years and you can, you can cast your vote. But it's, there's no much less rigor applied to that than there is to driving a car or to uh, serving alcohol or looking after kids, all of which are also important as well. Um, and, uh, and the media here and everywhere else, face, you know, and leaving Facebook aside, um, has a very hard time of staying on top of the truth and keeping people interested enough to get to the bottom of the truth. And I've got examples here and overseas of um, you know, very in-depth interviews on the ABC, still not getting at the truth with you know, sensible politicians and uh, mid, or mid, mid, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of middle ground politicians being asked questions by sensible journalists, but there is just not enough time for everybody to get to the truth. And I think that to get back to the truth, and to get there is there's a simplicity that we need to bring to, the, to bear, which I think you know everybody here is is trying to work on. Uh, but I think what we haven't talked about yet, and, and maybe some of the other sessions uh, could touch on, is uh, the role of media in in propping up our democracy, the role of schools and education in propping up our democracy, uh, because a lot of it is not just the community and the government. I think these other two these other two um, players also have a big role to play. Thank you, Marcus. And I know we, we probably won't have time to cover this properly, but there are two more questions for Roslyn on Citizen Lab and Sortition. Now, I suspect Sortition is not something you can cover in three seconds. Okay, yeah, sorry. I've been typing my answers all this time <laughs> into the chat box. Um, regarding Citizen Lab, yeah, we did, we did them in the report. Um, I think they have like very good visuals and are quite easy to use, which I think is like a huge plus and they have a really good solid all around functionality as well. Um, so um, that's something I particularly like about them and I think their participatory budgeting is quite good as well. Um, so yeah, we included them as well. Um, about sortition, um, it's not like I'm against sortition. I think sortition does have a role to play in a democracy, just not um, small scale sortition, like a lot of a lot of things that have kind of in the last few years kind of taken off is the idea of these very small citizens assemblies. You know, people think they're quite large, but they're actually really small. It's like a hundred people, that's hardly anybody. Um, so even 500 people, it's just like your chance of being selected for that is very, very low. And it's kind of become conflated with this idea that direct democracy is wrong. Like if you think something like Brexit, Brexit was wrong, it was a bad decision. I mean, I hear in Ireland, I'm feeling the brunt of Brexit a lot more than any of the rest of you. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a wrong, like this wrong idea, you know, there's a right and wrong decision. It's a very, actually very complex decision. Um, truck drivers now are being paid more than ever. Um, they're people who voted for Brexit. It was good for them. They were being paid lower wages. Now they're being paid higher wages. Like these are all factors that I think are just not being considered by people who aren't kind of living those lives. Um, so, but anyhow, sortition was put across as this thing that maybe, you know, people wouldn't have voted for Brexit because they would have known better than to vote for Brexit. I think this just does not take into consideration people's real concerns. I think um, the idea that everyone should be basically disenfranchised so that these, you know, this very, very small group of people, which is like focus group sized, should potentially even make binding recommendations for everybody, which is something that's put forward, not by all, but by some sorticianists, you know, and 
others don't really correct that to some extent. They don't really take a stance against it. So these kinds of things are quite, I think, crazy ideas, honestly. <laughs> That's coming from me, who's a very revolutionary direct Democrat. Um, so tradition does can have a role to play in an administrative side, but I don't think it should be taking anyone's vote. And I don't think it should be pushing this idea that we should be overturning referendums, because if only people were more informed, they'd surely think the thing I think. I don't think that's a good, a very democratic point of view. Thanks, Thanks very much, Roz. Uh, we, we've run out of time, but I'm going to pass back to Peter Tate to give his overall reflection on uh, what he's taking out of this discussion. Um, my brain processes slowly, so I don't have any imagining insights. I've written a few things down and I might put them into Twitter later on as I've reflected on them, but I think um, the, the, in order to have democracy work, it has to be informed. So I take Evan's point on that. And, and there are various um, people involved in, in helping the citizen be more informed. The challenge for me and the unanswered question um, is, is we have these people doing this, how do we get it into the mainstream in a way that it starts to become relevant to more people in the electorate. I'm also really interested in Thor's vote wrap idea and that process of hybridizing direct and representational democracy as a practical way of, of thinking about how we might move more people to be involved in politics um, once they become more informed. I take Plaxi's point that there's a lot of stuff out there and you can't know everything and as a, as a voter, you know, how do you get your head around some of these things if you're going to deliver a proxy to someone or if you're going to go and, you know, pick up your sausage on the way out from the polling booth on a Saturday afternoon in May next year? It's all, I mean, I think, you know, this is really fascinating work and I think we've barely touched the, you know, scratched the surface of this deeper conversation. And I think, um, yeah, it's going to be wonderful to go away and think about what's happening later on. Rosalind, it's probably not gonna work for you, but one of Sunday afternoon sessions uh, is actually talking about, you know, citizens juries and citizens assemblies and the experience there. But um, I don't expect you to show up because it's gonna be like 2 a.m. your time. Um, so I'll give you a leave pass on that one. But, you know, if you get inspired, there's, a, there's an invitation. Um, and yeah, well, Maybe we need to have more TV dramas based on Marcus's point that actually, you know, work through these issues like, you know, TV dramas have done with lots of other contentious and interesting issues in, in society. And as somebody pointed out earlier, I think, yeah, we do really badly at teaching young people to be prepared to be citizens and voters in our democracy and, and this concept of civics in, in schools. I mean, they do cover how parliament works, but they don't really talk about, you know, how you as a citizen can be actively involved in this democracy to whatever extent you feel comfortable. So I'll wrap up there and, and I'll thank Bob very much for his um, chairing of this meeting this morning. And I'll thank you all very much for your input and your contributions and um, for sparking this, this thing. And I think um, we have got the chat forum, so if anybody does have questions, stick them in there. I don't know that I can promise to do much about that, but maybe we'll have some space down the track to, to feel those around a bit and, and get some ideas. Um, so let me just have a quick look at my sheet here and say um, it's been a wonderful thing and we're back here at 11 o'clock which is in 25 minutes to listen to Tim Hollow um, talking about his people in experience and to be able to ask him some questions of that so thank you very much and um, don't leave the meeting if you don't want to because we're going to keep this open and live <laughs>